So in total, the discussion will be at the final of the, of the session. And uh, for me, it's a, it's a pleasure just to present uh, Susanna Price. She's a consultant, cardiologist, and intensivist at Royal Brompton Hospital in London. She's also an honorary senior lecturer of the, at the Imperial College of London, and also is a professor of practice in cardiology and intensive care. Her talk is about distinguishing features in management of acute heart failure in women. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for the introduction and thank you very much. It's fantastic to be here. What a beautiful place. Um, so thank you to the organisers. I'm going to take you now to where I work. So um, I have no conflicts at all relating to this, but my work is in cardiothoracic intensive care. And so I'm not going to just talk about the standard acute heart failure. I'm going to walk you into the most critically ill patients and show you, I think, that there are some fundamental and important differences down to cell signaling pathways that should change the way we approach women in critical illness. Uh, so I'm going to talk a bit about the outcomes. What do we actually know about women who go to intensive care with cardiovascular disease? Are they different in terms of their outcomes? I'm going to explore some of the potential causes that are related to the patient. I'm going to explore also some of the age and sex differences that are important. And then finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about what Hector Bueno touched on this morning, about what is it that we're doing as doctors that may actually fundamentally change outcomes for our patients, male and female. So just to start with a, a bit of background, uh, Critical care cardiology is changing fundamentally, so what used to be called the coronary care unit is now more looking like a cardiac intensive care unit. Our patients are older, they're sicker, they have multiple comorbidities, and the expectation is that we will do more to them, that we will intervene more often and take more and more advanced therapies. Our understanding of critical illness and our therapies that we inflict on our patients is very poor and remains poor. And by contrast to cardiology, where there's been enormous advances in our understanding, when I look at the data for 25 years of research related to sepsis and adult respiratory distress syndrome, not one trial in sepsis has been positive. And the only trials that have given us additional uh, data related to adult respiratory distress have been suggesting that we do less and we reduce harm, so protective uh, uh, lung volume ventilation, that sort of thing. So we're in a very different place in intensive care compared with where we are in cardiology. I'm not going to talk really about cardiac disease, but I'm going to talk about critical illness and then how it um, impacts on the female patient with cardiovascular critical illness. I'm not going to talk about coronary disease, I'm not going to talk specifically about heart failure except for in the context of cardiogenic shock. And I'm going to talk a lot about the underlying pathological processes and why they may be different between the two and also touch on differences in response to therapies. So first up, I'm going to take you through what we know in the literature and this is everything we know about the differences between men and women in critical illness. It's two slides with every single trial that we have and you'll see compared with cardiology, there's not much and there's not much of any quality at all. So the first uh, study is 2004, so we're only going back 15 years. It's Belgian intensive care units. It's 4,500 patients, more or less, and they wanted to see whether there was any difference between men and women in their survival. Is there a sex difference? And that came in the context where there was a perception that women did better in intensive care. And what they showed actually was that women had a higher mortality, which was a big surprise. And it was particularly bad in women with cardiovascular diseases. The Australians followed um, afterwards with a retrospective study, only 500 patients, and they again showed that men did better than women. We're then now looking at a Swedish study. It's absolutely huge, as you always expect from Sweden, over 120,000. They wanted to see if there were any uh, differences between the sex, uh, sexes, and they thought that women who were premenopausal might do better but actually they showed a better outcome in men than in women. So again, the signal is that men do better than women. And then down to North America and Canada, looking at 14,000 patients, again, a, no, a lower survival rate in women. So this was a big surprise to us in intensive care. We weren't expecting it. 
meta-analysis pooling as much as we had uh, was done in 2015. Um, and it suggested that there may be a protective outcome effect if you were female, if you had trauma. So women with polytrauma did better. So cardiovascular disease bad, but polytrauma better. Uh, again, from America, looking at whether uh, women or men did better, and there was a survival advantage, but for the younger women, not for the older women. But it was small, and it wasn't seen in women who had coronary artery bypass surgery. This study from um, Canada, I think, is nearly 20,000 patients, again, a higher mortality in sepsis septic shock. The same was seen in um, France and in the UK. And then finally, with Jean-Louis Vincent from um, uh, Brussels, he showed that female gender in critical care was an independent risk factor for mortality. So that's it. Those are all the data that we have globally for everything in critical care, so it's not much. But there are some strong signals there that, to suggest that women actually don't do better, except for possibly in trauma and possibly with COPD. And we actually do worse, which was, again, a big surprise to us in the intensive care community. There were a lot of discussion about why. Why is it that these women do uh, worse? And there was a lot of discussion around all of these things, which I think are pretty self-evident. There are some big physical differences between men and women in, cr in critical uh, care. There are some significant pharmacological differences, but also we respond differently to critical care. So the first thing is uh, women do tend to be smaller than men. But what is interesting is when we look at the changes in heights over 100 years, so this is 1914 to 2014, so when you're comparing size differences, you have to be careful when, when the data is taken. So the biggest change in height gain in women has been in South Korea, 142 to 162 centimetres over 100 years, so a 20 centimetre increase in the average height of the population. And the smallest women remain Guatemalans. Our colleagues from the Netherlands are still the tallest there is in the world. And the biggest height gain for men has been in Iran. This matters because of our drug dosage and also when you're using acute advanced supports. So when I think about putting a patient on ECMO, I do it very differently for a small woman than I do for a very tall man. So there are some physical differences that are important. Other things that we don't often think about as cardiologists, but you have to when you walk into the intensive care unit, relate to organs outside the heart. And you've heard a little bit about drug distribution and how it is different, and the pharmacokinetics and dynamics between men and women are different. But one important thing is to think about nutrition, which we don't frequently consider as cardiologists. So there's a survival disadvantage. You die more if you don't meet your nutritional targets in critical care. And it's particularly bad if you fail to meet your protein targets. So this isn't normally the top of uh, our consideration as cardiologists. And we do particularly badly as women because we have a smaller protein reserve. So the nutritionist input to your critical care unit or your cardiac intensive care unit is absolutely vital. There are also some pharmacological difficult, uh, differences. So female patients are more susceptible to certain drugs, which you can see here. They have variable and attenuated responses to some of the drugs we give under conditions of stress, which is certainly intensive care. And they may have a different substrate. So they may, you may see elderly women who have a subaortic septal bulge that may give them outflow tract obstruction. And you see that much more frequently in women than you do in men. So we need to be careful with our pharmacology. We have more adverse events in response to drugs than uh, male patients with the type of drugs we use on the unit. But also remember that women behave differently in response to recreational drugs. So as women take alcohol in, not only does it affect their cart and their liver differently, but we are much more susceptible to developing adverse or abnormal coagulation, even with non-toxic uh, doses of alcohol. And also remember about one in five women who were admitted to intensive care units were on some kind of hormone therapy. And this is mostly completely disregarded when the patient arrives on the unit. So that's the sort of generality of description of what's different. So I'm now going to talk about the mechanisms of maybe some of these differences that we're now just beginning to explore. So I'm going to go back to the most fundamental uh, response that we have to critical illness. And this is one of the earliest cave drawings from the in the world. And it shows a man here being attacked by some kind of bison-type animal. 
And the most fundamental human response to any kind of stress is the response that we see in trauma. And that's been uh, evolving over 20, 30 million years. And there's been some interesting um, studies done looking at the differences between men and women in response to trauma. And they are profound, and they are also the same differences as we're beginning to uncover in terms of response to sepsis and in shock of all types. So if you look at um, trauma and the severity of trauma, you'll see that immediately after injury, you'll have a nice correlation between your estrogen and progesterone ratio and your testosterone and what happens to your TNF-alpha immediately afterwards. And a very high estradiol level in both men and women is associated with the severity of the injury. But then what happens in response to the injury is very different between men and women. And you can see here that both will see, um, in fem females you see an increase in insulin-like growth factor one, but no change at all in transthyretin and a very different response in men. And these early studies led to the consideration that for men in trauma, remembering they did less well, that you could give a testosterone antagonist and that might improve outcomes, but actually, unfortunately, it didn't. But there was clearly a difference between men and women. Um, the question then came to, well, do men or women do better in trauma or not? And this is a nice study looking at, uh, they say gender-specific differences, but actually it's sex-specific differences in patients between 2002, 2011, and they did a very nice match pair analysis. It's nearly a 1,000 patients, and the things they showed was this. So firstly, uh, the women, the mechanism of injury in both groups was different. So women had much more head trauma in this group than men, and it was probably related to where they were injured. So the men were mostly injured in cars or on motorbikes, and the women were mostly uh, pedestrians and they were hit at high velocity and they saw much more head injury. The women died sooner with more severe trauma um, and they had much less sepsis. So their response over this period of time, overall there was no difference in mortality, but we died from different things. We died from the trauma. The men in this cohort died from late complications. And this NICE study, which is looking at leukocyte transcriptic, transcriptic responses, uh, looked at 333 leukocyte genes that were expressed uh, in men and women in response to injury. And they showed that the uh, starting pattern is different between men and women. The response to injury, looking at this heat map, is completely different. But the circulating cytokines in response did not follow completely perfectly the changes in gene expression. So we start differently, we respond differently to trauma, and then something happens between the gene expression and what you see in your circulating cytokines that again is different between men and women. And this led to a lot of um, consideration as to whether we could learn from this response and take it back to start looking at other types of shock. So not just trauma shock, but hemorrhagic shock, septic shock, and cardiogenic shock. So the first models came from septic shock, and remember that the uh, definition of sepsis and septic shock changes constantly, just like the definition of myocardial infarction. So this is the 2016 definition, and it suggests that sepsis is a life-threatening ordinary <coughs> dysfunction caused by a dysregulated host response to infection. So what you're seeing in your patient that is uh, manifest as organ dysfunction is actually their attempt to try to survive that eventually becomes potentially harmful. And in our SIRS response that we see in sepsis, and the same we see at the onset of cardiogenic shock and severe heart failure, the SIRS response starts with microbes, but we have these things, the PRRs, which are your toll-like receptors, the, the beginning of your pro and anti-inflammatory cytokine response that will neutralize the invading pathogen and hopefully allow you to survive. So that's a very fundamental response to every injury that we see. There's a difference, though, here in between men and women that is absolutely fundamental. So here are your toll-like receptors. Here's your incoming insult. And this is the pathway for toll-like receptors 2 and 4 with the production of the pro-inflammatory cytokine NF-kappa-beta, which is one of a number. And this enzyme here, IRAC, IRAC1, has multiple haplotypes, and it sits on the X chromosome. 
And there's one variant of it, which is the less common variant, which is associated with worse outcomes in sepsis, in hemorrhagic shock, in traumatic shock. And we're beginning to see the signal in cardiogenic shock. You might say, well, you know, how much of a difference? The difference is profound and large. So this is a lovely study looking at 321 patients. They looked at the IRAC1 variant, the one that conferred the worst outcome, and they looked at the difference between uh, men and women. And remember that this sits on the X chromosome. So this IRAC1 variant that's supposed to be bad for you is very bad for you. There's a more than eight-fold increase in morbidity and a more than 11-fold increase in mortality if you're unlucky to have a full dose of that, as some of our male uh, colleagues will have. And the difference is, of course, these bad outcomes are more different in men, and women exhibit a dose-response curve. So depending on how much of this haplotype you have on your X chromosome, you will do better or worse. And we never looked at these in our patients in critical care, and I don't think we look at them in any of our cardiology trials. But an 11 times increase in mortality in one group, and these are different in different groups um, where you look at different parts of the world. So it's not the same in Northern Europe as it is in South America. It may make a fundamental difference to the outcomes, but also may change some individualized therapies we come to in the future. What does this mean for the cardiac function? Well, this is exactly the same pathway you see in cardiogenic shock, where you may see a degree, degree of vasodilation or vasoconstriction, depending on the um, phenotype of shock you have, certainly hyper-responsiveness of the cardiomyocyte, myocyte injury, and endothelial injury. So a fundamental cell signaling pathway component, IREC1, is different between men and women, confers an 11-fold increase in mortality, and, and is involved in the cell signaling pathway in cardiogenic shock. So it's an area that is ripe for research, and we should see some data coming out in the next couple of years. So finally, I'm going to talk about the patient as a whole, just in the last two or three slides, and also us as doctors. So is there a difference, really, between sex and age-based uh, differences in critical care? If we look at what we do to our patients and why, so why might there be a difference? There's a difference when you look at older women. There isn't much of a difference in what we do to patients when we look at younger patients. But once women hit 50, everything changes. They're less likely to be admitted to the ICU. They're less likely to be ventilated. They're less likely in cardiovascular disease to have a pulmonary artery catheter. They're less likely to have all of the evidence-based therapies that show benefit. They have a shorter length of stay on the ICU. They have a longer length of stay in hospital, which suggests they're being discharged maybe a little bit too early, and they have a higher mortality. So what we're doing to our older women on the ICU, these ones with a higher comorbidities, is less evidence-based, discharging them early, and they have a higher associated mortality. And then just finally, finally, what about the doctors? And I remember Hector Bueno this morning touched on one study. This is another study uh, published in the Quarterly Journal of Medicine 2018. And they looked at how uh, doctors in the emergency department, depending on whether they were male or female, and whether they were treating a male patient or a female patient, approached the patient and what they did with them. And they showed some fundamental differences, such as the male physicians triage and prioritize patients that are referred from other specialties. And the female physicians prioritize the patients that have just come in through the front door. So they have different prioritization. The male physicians were much more likely to admit the patients to intensive care if you looked at matched patients than were the female patients. But the biggest difference came was the female patients, female physicians treating the female patients. And they were much less likely to admit these patients either to the CCU or the ICU. So there needs to be some change in the way we, treat, we train our young doctors to look at the way we look at our female patients because there is something strange going on. They don't even get into the ICU or the ICCU. So with that, I'll finish and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much.